Welcome to episode 20362036, and thank you for joining me today. Before I forget, if you like the show, or hey, even if you don't like the show, but you're still watching, <laughs> I know we have some of those people, please do make a, write a review, especially, and uh, one of our listeners, Kurt, brought this to our attention, we don't have many reviews on Spotify, and if you're listening, getting the content on Spotify, we'd love your review there, Apple Podcasts, wherever you listen or get the podcast. And then, of course, if you're on YouTube, comment below. We try to read every single comment, and sometimes we respond right there, but we definitely respond to your comments on the show on future episodes. So comment below. Tell us what you think. We love to hear your opinions. We've got such a, a wise and brilliant audience that your comments are greatly appreciated. You know, some of the articles that you've shared with us, some of the links, those are tremendous resources. We really appreciate that. And you're helping the other listeners because that content is woven into future episodes. So we really love that. Okay, so let's look at a couple things here before we get to our main segment today, which is an interview I did with Dean Rogers. I think you'll enjoy it a lot. A lot of content there coming up. But before we get to that, you know, a lot of people are talking about where the market is going, what's going on with consumers, are they broke, are they doing well? That is a fair question. And we know from the prior episodes that as far as the homeowner consumer, they are doing quite well. Okay, amazingly. I know it's amazing. If they purchased a house within the last couple of years, they experienced some of the lowest rates in history ever. And debt to income ratio is very low. They've got high credit scores. The default rate is like non-existent basically. So you just don't have distress in the market. So we've talked about that ad nauseum and we've only touched on this other issue a little bit. So let's just touch on that a little more before we get to our main segment today. And that is mortgage debt service payments as a percentage of disposable income. Mortgage debt payments as a percentage of disposable income. So in other words, how comfortable are these mortgage payments for people, especially if they purchased a house after the big interest rate hikes? Fair question, right? And what we're seeing amazingly is we are seeing home buyers adjust their expectations just like I said they would when everybody had this linear view of you know this home buyer this mortgage payment and they get this house for this mortgage payment right those things are dynamic they are not the same and a myopic view of it would be to think that okay that buyer can no longer afford that house so the market's going to be devastated everything's going to fall apart that's a disaster no it's not a disaster because they simply adjust they adjust their expectations and they learn to accept less. They go out as rational actors into the marketplace and they get the best deal they can. They buy as much house as they can. And if that house is no longer as good as it used to be, then they simply adjust their expectations. Okay, so let's look at what happened here. If, if you are watching on video, you see this chart, which is a St. Louis Federal Reserve, you know, the Fred website, the most commonly used one, a chart of mortgage debt service payments as a percentage of disposable income. And they've got two versions of this. They've got what they call their vintage series, and then they've got their new series. So that's why you see two different lines here. But they're roughly the same, okay? It, it, they don't diverge a lot, so it's just not worth going into that rabbit hole, okay? Because they're very, very close. And what you see here is, of course, during the COVID era, you saw houses become tremendously affordable. And so you see this mortgage payment as a percentage of debt service, you see it as a very low number where houses were just incredibly affordable because of the incredibly low interest rates and it was before prices shot up so much. And now you see this ratio deteriorating. It is getting worse. Houses are have become, you know, dramatically more unaffordable. Okay, so people are going to rent. There's going to be fewer buyers, less buying activity, but the buying activity that does exist, even though it's lower, 
is people who have adjusted expectations like we talked about. So the misleading thing you hear out there is, oh my gosh, the mortgage debt service load is getting so dramatically high. But compared to the COVID era where it was like the lowest ever, okay, well, not like the lowest ever, literally the lowest on this chart. Okay, so if if you bought a house or if anyone bought a house during the COVID era, right? So we're looking at, you know, 20, 2020, 2021, right? But compared to what? I mean, when you ask yourself compared to what? It is very favorable right now because this chart goes back to the early 80s, okay? So look at when this ratio was the worst. It was the worst in 2005, 2006, 2007, 8, 9, 10, right? That, well, no, 2010, it had improved dramatically. So that was leading up to the Great Recession, obviously, or, or during the Great Recession. Everything became extremely burdensome. The debt ratio was really high. Homeowners were obviously struggling. Millions of them decided to do loan mods, workouts, short sales, whatever, right? But even before that, I mean, the early 2000s, thousands when the market was booming the 90s back into the 80s i mean all of these times this burden was much higher than it is today with these incredibly high mortgage rates and much higher home prices so it is just incredibly important that people always ask the compare to what question and when you compare to a really small time frame you can say, oh my gosh, compared to last year, homes are becoming extremely unaffordable. It's terrible. Everything's a disaster. People are being crushed by the debt burden. Well, no, they're not. They were being crushed much worse five years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, 25 years ago. This debt burden was dramatically higher than it is today. It is much lower now. Now, the anomaly time, of course, was the COVID era when it was incredibly low. So it's just so important to have a longer term perspective. Whenever we evaluate anything, of course, we must ask life's most important question compared to what? And maybe a good way to look at this is like you're in a museum. Okay, I, look, I just got back from a five week trip to Europe recently, and I went to a few museums when I was there. And, you know, you can go to the museum and you can walk up to every gorgeous painting, you know, these beautiful Renaissance or Impressionist paintings, right? And you walk up to the painting and you can stand four inches away with your nose four inches from the canvas. And what are you going to see? Well, you're going to see some brush strokes. But if you stand back a foot, you're going to see more and you're going to see more context and you're going to see more comparisons, comparing one piece of the painting to the other. Well, what if you step back four feet or five feet? You're going to see the whole picture. You're gonna see the big picture. And that's what I'm always trying to get people to do. Instead of falling for the clickbait headlines where you're only seeing the brush strokes, back up, see the big picture very important lesson for anything in life, not just statistics about the economy and the real estate market. Okay, this one I think I shared with you before, but I just wanted to highlight it one more quick time. This is about Fannie Mae and Fannie Mae's incredible run that they're having, believe it or not. I mean, you would think the mortgage business is just a disaster, right? And it is for many mortgage companies because of course we had the biggest mortgage and refi boom in history just a couple years ago during the COVID era. And now these mortgage companies have to downsize, right size, do layoffs, figure it out. And they've done that and we've reported on it. But even, even then, take a look at Fannie Mae. This is the biggest player in the mortgage market. This article is entitled Fannie Mae notches $5 billion profits in the second quarter, but still expects a recession. The government sponsored entity said it now expects a 3.9% increase in home prices this year. Okay, so you take into account linear cyclical hybrid markets, three, you know, 4% increase 
ain't bad considering that we've had these massive interest rate increases. But look at this. In fact, Fannie Mae is no longer predicting a decline in home prices in 2023. The government-sponsored enterprise forecast now calls for a 3.9% home price increase this year, though they think a recession is still on its way. Now, remember something too. You can have a broad economic recession and not have a housing market recession, or you could have a housing market recession and a broad economy that's doing okay, right? There are sectors, so we've got to always remember that. But check this out. Average single family conventional guarantee book of business. This is the, you know, the, the business that they're guaranteeing these mortgages, right? Okay. Declined by 1.4 billion in the first quarter. Okay. Driven by acquisition volumes being lower than loan paydowns during the quarter. Credit characteristics for single family conventional mortgages remained strong with a weighted average mark-to-market loan-to-value of 51%. Oh my God, did you hear that? Just remember what you just heard. That means that of the loans they're doing, the average amount of equity in the property is 49%. (laughs) Oh, yeah, these people are so over encumbered and so distressed, right? I mean, this is just nobody's walking away from a house where they own half of it and the and the lender only owns half of it. OK, it's, it's just, you know, where is the distress going to come from, folks? And a weighted average FICO credit score at origination of 752. Remember, 720 is the gold standard. So this is far above the gold standard, okay? I mean, it's just, it's just unbelievable. Now, the, the last point I'll make on this. Single-family serious delinquency rate decreased to 0.55% as of June 30th of this year from 0.59% as of March of this year. So first quarter, second quarter, right? So the delinquency rate is falling. These mortgages are in better shape and people have tons of equity, high credit scores, and a low debt burden. Okay. I guess the market's going to collapse. Keep reading the clickbait headlines. (laughs) It's, It's just unbelievable. Anyway, today we are going to share with you an interview that I did recently, and I think you'll enjoy it. Sometimes those really are the best content. You all tell me that. And then next week, we're going to have Harry Dent, the ultimate doom and gloomer coming up for you. He's been on the show maybe 11 or 12 times over the years. You know, great guest, famous author, as you know, been gloomy for a long, long time time predicting a big bubble. So we'll see what he has to say. And we'll probably have that one for you next week. All right, here we go. Let's go to the interview. Hey, what's up, everybody? It's Dean Rogers. Today, we have an incredibly special guest, Mr. Jason Hartman. What's up, Jason? Hey, Dean, good to see you. Good to see you too, man. I'm super excited to have you on. You just gave a presentation recently that I just was spoon feeding myself because when, when there's somebody that is talking about the economy, talking about the market with real data, then I'm just, I couldn't be more excited about it because there's, there's too many people out there, the crash bros, everybody yeah. just throwing out a bunch of information that isn't backed by anything. So I'm incredibly excited to have you on today. Jason, I'm excited to have you on. You're actually going to be doing some show and tell today, sharing your screen. So yep. let's dive into it, man. Let's talk about the market. What you think? All right. Sounds good. Well, thanks for having me, Dean. So there are so many misconceptions out there nowadays in terms of the economy, the real estate market. And I want to peel back the onion and tell people what's really going on based on real data and based on a lot of experience that I have. We will kind of dive into that. And, you know, it's just funny. First, I want to say how the human mind works. I mean, through eons of evolution, our mind was trained to look for negative things because throughout history, really until the Industrial Revolution, the negative things could kill us 
right? That could end our life either through starvation or getting attacked by another human or an animal or whatever, right? So, you know, our mind is keenly tuned to watch out for negative things and pay attention to them, right? But now we live in this world of abundance. I mean, look at the obesity rates and we clearly have too much abundance, right? It's really a different world. And and the game has changed. There's an old saying in the news media, if it bleeds, it leads right? Sensationalism and clickbait, that works. It works really well because of that propensity for all of us to look for negative things, right? But Mm. when it comes to the real estate market, people are creating so many blind spots for themselves and missing so many opportunities because of this bias toward negativity. There's this whole group of people at the beginning of the COVID era, we started calling them the crash bros. Okay. These are the chicken little, the sky is falling people, you know, the, the Malthusians who Malthus was an economist like 250 years ago that thought overpopulation would end humanity because we'd run out of food. Well, clearly we didn't do that. Right. You know, this whole like scarcity mindset is really interesting. So the crash bros have been wrong, 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 wrong. And I think you'll see from my talk today, I think they're going to continue to be wrong for a while. They won't be wrong forever. There will always be cycles and corrections and adjustments. But so many people are equating this to the 2008 Great Recession, which was a lifetime event. That was the worst economy in seven decades. Okay, I'd been through several cycles before that. Okay, that was a a special event. Okay, it was not Mm -hmm. a normal thing. It was the worst economy we had since the Great Depression of the 1930s, which was obviously a historic event, right? So when we really look at what's going on, I think we will see there is a very different picture than is being portrayed in all the clickbait sensationalist headlines. So let's go ahead and dive in. And first, let's understand what is the business plan for governments and central banks? I always say that the two most powerful entities the human race has ever known are governments and central banks. The governments have standing armies and they work in tandem with the central banks like our Federal Reserve or the European Central Bank or the Bank of Japan or, you know, every country that has a central bank. They control everything. Okay. And our government and pretty much every other government is working with the Federal Reserve or or their central bank to create an explosion of currency units. Some people call it fiat money. That's what the dollar is. And fiat, that word simply means by decree or by authority. You know, the dollar has value because they say so, right? And we all have to believe it. (laughs) And the government is very much in debt. It has overspent dramatically. It's in debt to the tune, and for those watching on video, I'll share my screen with you. This is the famous debt clock, or the infamous debt clock maybe, that many people have seen and are familiar with. And normally this is a moving uh, thing if you visit the website, but I just took a screenshot of it here the other day. Over $32 trillion in debt. And what's important though, Dean, is this one. Look down here, unfunded liabilities, $192 trillion, okay? And so what does this mean? Let's compare this. What is the economic output of the entire country every year? Well, it's, you know, it's about 23 trillion, 24 trillion dollars, something like that. Okay. So if you add these two together, you've got about 220 trillion dollars, right? That we have to somehow pay for. You cannot pay for this by raising taxes. That's impossible. The tax revenue every year for the government is about $4 trillion. There's, there's no way. You tax people at 100%, it would still take 11 years of everybody working just as hard as they work now and giving 100% of their money to Uncle Sam. Okay, that's not going to happen, obviously. And so this equation doesn't work. So what does work? Well, I say that the business plan of governments and central banks is the same business plan that all of us as investors should follow. We should just follow their lead and do exactly what they're doing. You know, there's an old saying, if you can't beat them, join them, right? Mm. And so we're going to kind of join them through this strategy that I trademarked years and years ago. I've been teaching this for 18 years. It's called inflation-induced debt destruction. 
And Dean, this is the hidden wealth creator with income property. Let's take an example. Say someone listening to your show gets inspired and they decide they want to start building a portfolio. And they think, okay, you know, I'm going to buy four or five houses. And say those four or five houses cost $1.2 million. And they get loans on those houses totaling a million dollars. Okay, so they got a million dollars in mortgages. They get their first mortgage statements, you know, the first month of owning the property. And it says their balance is $1 million. And then five years goes by. And well, let's just say one year goes by or whatever time goes by, a year, two years, three years, whatever. And say there's 10% inflation that occurs during that time, which I think most people would say would happen in a year because the <laughs> official inflation numbers are a lie. You know, that's quoted by the CPI, the Consumer Price Index, and I call it the CP lie, okay? Because it's, <laughs> it's clearly manipulated, right? Yeah. And so that 10% inflation that occurs over whatever time period, basically literally just paid off $100,000 of your million dollars in mortgages because you borrow the money at today's value, but you pay it back after inflation at a cheaper value. So that's inflation-induced debt destruction. And this is the hidden wealth creator that very few people really see or understand that's going on behind the scenes with a real estate investment. And you can't really do it with anything else very well, okay? Because you can't get 30-year fixed rate debt on other, other assets. You can't get rental income on other assets. You can't do this by buying gold or stocks or Bitcoin or really anything else. Income property is a very unique special asset class because it mm -hmm. has these multi-dimensional characteristics. And why would this be the business plan of the government? Well, we owe about a trillion dollars to China, and we have the reserve currency of the world, the US dollar, meaning that's the currency that all international trade is denominated in, the US dollar. So if we inflate the value of our dollar away by 10% as a country, that means we get a $100 billion discount on that debt every time there's 10% inflation, whether it takes place in a year or three years, doesn't matter, right? It's a discount. So this is the path the government is likely to stick with, okay? Hmm. Now, inflation hurts most people, it impoverishes most people, it destroys their standard of living. I always like to say inflation destroys the value of stocks, bonds, and savings, but thankfully, it also destroys the value of debt. Isn't that a beautiful thing? <laughs> if, so. if you use that leverage uh, to your advantage and you're in, you're in the know, then yeah, that is beautiful. Yeah. And, and this, is, this is that hidden wealth creator that's happening behind the scenes. But regardless of inflation-induced debt destruction, let's just take a look at the market overall, okay? And this just shows you different assets a person might have and their strength versus inflation. And basically on the bottom, the worst assets are cash because that goes down in value with inflation. Bonds, same thing, pension income. Taxation is not really calculated properly against inflation. And that's a long explanation, so I'm not gonna go into that one today. But job income, you know, that's sort of medium strength because hopefully you get a cost of living increase at your job. Your rental income on your properties, hopefully you raise the rental income at the rate of inflation. And then stocks usually perform about the rate of inflation, right? So they, they hedge inflation pretty well. The high strength items, the gold bugs would tell you gold is the best, right? I'm definitely not a gold bug. I own some of it, sure, but you can't rent it out. You can't finance it over 30 years. And unlike income property, it gets terrible tax treatment when income property is the most tax favored asset class in America. And taxes are the single largest expense any of us have. Mm. So that's great. The mortgage, this is the hidden gem. That I was just talking about, okay? Because this mortgage debt gets debased by inflation. It gets paid off by inflation. It's like free money that's happening behind the scenes. And then the value of the real estate is like gold hedged against inflation pretty well. 
-hmm. usually rises faster than the rate of inflation. Okay. So that's that. I don't have time to go into the strength versus deflation at the moment, but when we look at the market, I think it's really important for people to understand why we have such low inventory. And yes, we do have very low inventory. And I don't have a chart to show you on this, but I'll just tell you, okay? There are two major sources that we use for inventory stats in terms of how many properties are in the market throughout the country. One is the National Association of Realtors. And I don't like their data because it includes contingent sales and pending sales, properties you really actually can't buy today, right? And it includes listed homes that are for sale that you could buy. So I use another data set by a company called Altos that's been on my show several times, and they just count the for sale properties only. So their estimate, I think, is much more accurate. So if something's listed for sale in the MLS, it's counted. How many properties are there right now? About 465,000 listed for sale. Compared to what? How do we know what that means? Well, if I always like to liken the market to a sink. So if everybody would think for a moment of their kitchen sink. So Dean, your kitchen sink, is it stainless steel or porcelain or what? What's it look like? Stainless steel, yep. <laughs> okay, stainless steel. So you got your kitchen sink there, you've got the big basin, you've got a drain, and you got a faucet. The faucet mm -hmm. represents the new properties coming onto the market, okay? The new listings that are coming up for sale. The basin of the sink represents the existing inventory of homes for sale. Now, 465,000. That's the existing inventory. The drain represents the buyers buying the properties, taking them out of the sink, taking them off the market because they're buying them, or the absorption rate, okay? Mm -hmm. So what, what have we got going right now? Well, we have the faucet is on, but it's just barely trickling. Hardly any new properties are coming on the market. We've got the basin of the sink that if we consider that a normal market would be that the sink is full and a, a buyer's market where it's considered a bad market or a recessionary market or a bust or a crash would be the sink is overflowing. There's way too many properties for sale. Right. Okay. So what do we have now? The sink is about 35% full. A lot of empty space in that sink of mm -hmm. inventory that should be there to be at a normal market, but it's not there because we have an inventory shortage. Now the drain, interest rates almost tripled. Think about it. Think about how amazingly resilient real estate is, how strong this asset class is. Why do I say that? Because if the typical new buyer of an owner-occupied home is financing 90% of the purchase price and putting 10% down, and you take the cost of money on 90% of the value and almost triple it a year ago. And still, we don't have a flood of properties on the market. We don't have an oversupply. We have the drain that is slightly plugged up because there is less demand with the higher rates. Now, normally, if that were to happen, the sink would start filling up and overflowing if the drain were plugged. Right. But the drain's only about 20% plugged. About 80% of it is still open and property is still being purchased, but 20% less demand, okay, approximately. I mean, it varies from market to market. That's just an overall number. And it varies from time to time, right? So that's what you've got. You've got a sink that's barely full. You've got a faucet at a trickle, and you've got a drain that's 20% plugged up with 80% open. And why is this? Why is the faucet at a trickle? Well, it's largely because of this chart. And this chart shows you that about 25% of the country has a mortgage at or below 3%. They have incredibly comfortable mortgage payments on a mortgage that cannot even come close to being replaced right now because it's so cheap. And about 65% of the country has a mortgage at or below 4%, also wow. very, very cheap. Yeah. These mortgages, Dean, have become a huge asset, not a liability, an asset that if you sell the house, you're going to lose the asset. And let me just ask everybody listening and, and you too, is it possible that 
some item that you possess can be worth more to you than it is to a new buyer buying it. Of course it is, right? You probably have some material object of sentimental value that is more valuable to you than it is to somebody else. You have your loved ones, maybe you have an animal, you know, that's more valuable to you than it is to some stranger who doesn't care about it, right? Okay, mm -hmm. so that's the way it is with all these houses that aren't for sale. They're much more valuable to the person that already owns them than they are to the market, right? If they put them on the market and they sold them, the value of that house might be worth $600,000 to the owner when you equate the cheap mortgage and only $500,000 to the buyer who has to get an expensive mortgage. So this is the thing we're in, and this is a lock-in. All of these houses, tens of millions of them are locked in with cheap mortgages. It's like the golden handcuffs, you know, they use in corporate America, the golden handcuffs, right? You're not gonna leave your job because they got some thing out in the future that they're gonna give you, right? And mm -hmm. that's the golden handcuffs. And this is exactly what's going on with the real estate market. And these people have 28 years left on these mortgages. We're gonna have an inventory shortage for a long time, in my opinion. So that's the state of the market. The only real amount of inventory is coming from new builds, new construction. And guess what? Investors like inexpensive properties. That's what you specialize in. That's what I buy. We like entry level houses because those right. are the best rent to value ratios. No builder is building those properties, virtually almost non-existent. Show me please somebody, where can I buy a brand new $200,000 home from a developer? <laughs> crickets it yeah. just doesn't exist that's an entry-level home the average new home price is four hundred and seventy-five thousand dollars. well in this supposedly down market <laughs> you know yeah. I, I mean it's just unbelievable right so we have a housing affordability problem and a housing shortage of epic proportions right now it is, we're, our deficit is like 700,000 houses missing from the market, okay? And to just help people understand how bad these numbers really are. We got a country of 332 million people. There's about 140 million housing units and only 465,000 of them are actually for sale. Out of 140 million, there's like yeah. nothing for sale. Just a fraction. Yeah, just a tiny fraction. So pretty incredible, huh? Yeah, it's pretty nuts. I mean, what's the compelling reason to sell? There's there's a more compelling reason to keep yeah. the house, right? right? And with the option of selling, right? If there's some sort of equity that was gained, if they need to live somewhere else, which they do, that next house is going to be more expensive. Yeah. Not only the price, but the actual cost of the money, the mortgage right. payment. Yeah, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. So here's a business opportunity for people. If anyone is interested in getting into the home remodeling business, that's probably got a pretty good future because all of these tens of millions of people aren't going to want to sell their houses. So if they have extra money, they're going to remodel the kitchen. They're going to mm -hmm. remodel the bathrooms. They're going to add a bedroom. They're going to put a master bedroom upstairs, right? So they're stuck unless interest rates come back down near where they were before. If that happens, then yes, they're not stuck anymore and they'll sell. But guess what? They're going to buy something else to take advantage of the cheap rates. And that increased housing affordability, which housing affordability right now is it like the lowest level in 37 years. It's terrible because the cost of money went up so much. So what does that do? That means these people, there's the, the choice. They got to buy or rent or be homeless. So they're going to rent. And so every 1% drop in the home ownership rate equals about 1 million more tenants that need to rent something. So if you are a buy and hold landlord investor, <laughs> rents are going up, folks. I mean, right. you know, they have temporarily decelerated a bit to like the pre-pandemic levels. They're still rising, but not as much as they were before. And in the apartment market, which is suffering a lot because there was just too much inventory built and a lot of it hitting the market at the same time, rents are definitely softening in apartment complexes, but not single family homes. Okay. And I say the rents in single family homes are going up a lot more than they are today.